Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Ken McTamney from William Blair. We're going to get into a lot of areas. Ken, just he's got a lot going on in that mind of his, and he's going to give us a lot of names and a lot of ideas. This week in the mailbag, thoughtful questions from regular correspondents Al M. and Ludwig H. Listener Coach Z wants to know if it's ever okay to use leverage. The answer is yes, and I'll tell you exactly how. In my opening rant this week, if only there were signs of speculative excess. I'll show you the latest and perhaps most mind-boggling example of them all. It makes the GameStop fiasco look perfectly reasonable. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So what in the world could make GameStop, this deteriorating, melting ice cube of a business that went from like literally like a hundred bagger and then crash 90%, what could make that situation look reasonable? Well, the company is called Hometown International. What is Hometown International, you ask? Hometown International is a public company. The ticker symbol is HWIN. And it's got a market cap of lately around 100 million bucks. And its business <laughs> is that it owns a single delicatessen in rural New Jersey. I'm not kidding. The town is like, I think the population is like 3,500. And the hedge fund manager, David Einhorn, kind of broke this story. He, somebody pointed it out to him and he included it in his latest investor letter. <laughs> and it's a little bit insane that a company that did something like $14,000 of revenue, I'm not kidding, in all of last year, in all of 2020, they did like 14,000 of revenue, is valued at $100 million. And like the biggest shareholders, like the CEO and the CFO and the treasurer, and he's a director on the board of directors. And, and like, he's a wrestling coach at the high school next door to the deli. I mean, <laughs> the situation is insane, right? It's a hundred million dollar valuation on this. Okay. But as Matt Levine in uh, Bloomberg points out, no, no, it's worse than that. It's not a $100 million deli, Matt says. It's a $2 billion deli. Matt dug into the hometown international 10K and he discovered all of these warrants, right? Warrants are kind of like options that are outstanding. So he says the simple valuation math and he goes through this one paragraph where he puts it all together and, and there's like, 7.8 million shares uh, accounted for by some options. But then there's an absurd, he says, but also an absurd 155.9 million warrants. So when you put it all together uh, with the current, you know, outstanding shares plus the absurd 155.9 million warrants and multiply it by the current share price, the fully diluted equity value of this single delicatessen in rural New Jersey is 1.9 billion. <laughs> I mean, this is insane. The stock has been around 13 bucks. I mean, I wonder if it's even worth 13 cents. <laughs> it's just nuts. I don't know. I I just I don't know what to tell you. It's the it's literally the single most insane example of overvalued speculative froth. It outdoes anything in cryptocurrency. It outdoes any other stock you could ever name. It makes GameStop look sensible and rational. It's crazy. We live in crazy times.
Oy. All right, so I'm going to shift gears for my quote of the week and and shift from insane to wonderfully rational. Um, and if you don't read, the, the quote is from Jeff Bezos from his 2020 Amazon shareholder letter. It's also his last as CEO. He's stepping down. If you don't read Amazon shareholder letters, you're really missing a great lesson in, in business. Um, he includes his original 1997 shareholder letter in every other one. So you, he's always measuring against that benchmark. You know, I can, I can tell you my experience with public companies is they don't want you to remember what they said five years ago or two years ago or last year because they want to have to tell you, you know, they want to spin a new narrative. So this is a most, the most brilliant example of an executive and a founder setting himself up for the market and for shareholders and everyone to create a feedback loop that he learns from and grows you know, a good business into the one of the great businesses of all time. And here's a brief example. Here's the quote of the week. If you want to be successful in business, in life actually, you have to create more than you consume. Your goal should be to create value for everyone you interact with. Any business that doesn't create value for those it touches, even if it appears successful on the surface, isn't long for this world. It's on the way out. That's Jeff Bezos from his 2020 Amazon shareholder letter. And, and that is just one of the brilliant nuggets that you could take out of any, almost any Bezos shareholder letter going back to 1997. I highly recommend that you read them. And there's a brilliant little section in here where he, he takes a, a excerpt from a book that's about biology and, and evolution. And then he turns it into a metaphor for companies and how they grow. It's, it's really great. All right. Let's talk with today's guest, Ken McTamney. Let's do it right now. You know I'm not a fan of the federal government interfering with the economy, but I've seen more people than ever demanding even greater government intervention than ever, including wiping away debts and free health care and you name it. These changes will affect you and your money. The next few years could be troubled times, including big market losses, but you can protect yourself. We recently sat down with Dr. Ron Paul, a former 12-term congressman, Air Force surgeon, and three-time presidential candidate to talk about America's big financial problem. You can watch that video at dancurrencywarning.com. In that video, Dr. Paul will introduce you to a way to opt out of a potentially troubled and bankrupt future. Nobody knows more about these problems than Dr. Ron Paul. Go to dancurrencywarning.com and learn the three steps we recommend you take now to protect yourself and your money. All right, it's time for our interview now. Today's guest is Ken McTamney. Ken McTamney is the head of the global equity team and a portfolio manager for William Blair's International Growth global leaders, and international leader strategies. He was previously co-director of research and a mid-large cap industrials and healthcare analyst. Before joining William Blair in 2005, Ken was a vice president at Goldman Sachs and Company, where he was responsible for institutional equity research coverage for both international and domestic equity. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dan. Really glad you could be here. You know, I, I just have to ask about Goldman Sachs just just because you know ever since uh, Matt Tybee called it the the vampire squid of Wall Street, anytime I run into somebody who worked there, I, I just want to know what the experience was like, you know certainly what you did there too, but just the experience of working at Goldman Sachs. Um, sure, and thanks. It, it 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 was a it's a great place to be from. I'll say that the uh, the training uh, that one gets there, the the quality of the institution, the the quality of the of the people, the intensity, um, the commitment to excellence, it it truly is world class. Very very strong culture and one where they do spend a lot of time on on people and on on process there. So I think world leading um, in many of those in many of those respects. And I've, you know, I owe a lot to that experience that I had uh, there at Goldman Sachs. I did join the firm prior to uh, them going public. And I think that that transition 
for the for the organization, perhaps necessary for them to achieve their growth ambitions, I think did change the the, the culture in the organization um, a little bit. I think that's pretty typical when you when you get a a transition like that, plus a lot of growth at the same time. Uh, quite pleased to be at William Blair, where we're very uh, proudly uh, independent and privately owned by our own employees for the last uh, over 85 years. So hopefully a lot of that good cultural experience that we had at at Goldman Sachs, we've been able to to retain at William Blair in a way that makes our organization uh, equally um, a compelling place to, to work. Interesting. I didn't know that about William Blair. So let's just kind of dive in and and talk about what you're doing now head of global equity team portfolio manager and you know international growth global leaders what are global leaders and international leaders what what is what is leaders yeah thanks for the question uh we a little bit of a backdrop we we invest in companies that that we think are the great value creating companies of tomorrow these are companies that are are the innovators they're the disruptors they're the ones that are going to you know solve economic um, and and social problems via their commercial offering and hopefully generate a lot of returns for shareholders you could call us quality growth investors i think that would be a that would be an appropriate uh, category to put us within, but what we're really trying to identify are those companies that we think truly have something intrinsically differentiated about what they do or how they're organized, such that they can create very long-term sustainable value for their customers, for their employees, for all their stakeholders, and certainly for for shareholders like us. So within that, the leaders in, in that universe um, are I would say are the top quintile or quartile of those value creating companies where we just have that much more confidence in their long term ability to generate uh, returns for their their shareholders. Okay, I like the word long term. What what's um what's what is long term to you guys? Hmm. We're trying to forecast the economic opportunity for a company over the next, certainly the next economic cycle. So over the course of the next five to 10 years. Um, beyond that, I think it gets really, really difficult. And frankly, when you're out 10 years in, a, in the pace of change that we're seeing around the world right now, it, it, you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty fuzzy out there, but we really do force ourselves to, to build a practice around thinking, how could things be different in the future, what are the preconditions that exist such that um, some things will will become further entrenched, but some things are more likely to be disrupted? Where do we see the R&D dollars being spent today that will lead to uh, innovation and, and and new value creation into the future. So, you know, we try to use the the past as much as we can to look out there. You know, I'd say over the course of the next five to ten years. Yeah, that does sound hard. <laughs> How many people do you have doing that? Like when I hear somebody, you know, talk about the next five years and we're trying to find the high, it sounds like you're trying to find the highest quality, most innovative companies, most sustainable business models. Frankly, a lot of people say that, right? Yeah, sure. You know, what does, how many people do you have kind of just focused on that? Just focused on figuring out, you know, what the best of the best of these, you know, kind of innovative, sustainable growth companies are? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because these words are easy to say, much, much harder to, to execute upon. So our team is structured around um, global industry expertise. And we have um, seven or eight portfolio managers that have, uh, like myself, been doing this for quite some time. I think we average around 15 years um, at William Blair and you know 20 some years in the industry. We have about 20 sector and industry analysts um, and they're supported by another 10 or 12 research associates. So our re the core of our research team, and it really is the core of what we do, is about 30 people who do that function. We also have a, a, a quantitative and data analytics group um, as well. We have about seven or eight people who do that. And they really have a slightly different set of background and skills to what our sector analysts 
uh, might have to offer in that they're much more um, um, steeped in in data analysis and and technology skills, and that really helps us as global investors get our arms around the entire opportunity set. You know, there are over ten thousand companies listed around the world that are investable uh, to us, and to try to get that down to a manageable group of companies that we can actually provide the right level of intellectual rigor to so we can come up with investment insights. Um, that's 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 a difficult process. We could use a lot of um, leading edge data and information technology to help us understand uh, what that opportunity set looks like. And I think that's a unique part of, of what we do. We like to say that we're kind of equal parts, as fundamental analysts, we're, we're equal parts um, uh, artisans and equal parts um, engineer. So we're trying to bring all of that together, the art and the science of investing to really help us in, in all parts of our investment endeavors. So let's talk about that, the sort of science uh, slash engineering side of that for a second. Um, sure. th- this team of people that you describe, I mean, these sound like your, your quants. I assume that when you talk about their expertise in data analysis, that you know, they're not analyzing IT companies, they're looking at price data and fundamental data and processing it in a way that gives you some insight about who's really, who's really the best, you know, at, at some particular, in some particular industry. Yeah, that's, that's fair in that is that's, they're not, they're not analyzing the companies themselves so much as the, the fundamental attributes of a company in, in a highly objective way and doing it at scale. Um, they can compare you know, thousands of thousands of, of companies across millions of, of data points. What they're not doing is making investment decisions for us. They're just helping us, uh, helping to point us in a direction, helping us assess risk reward, things like that. But they don't make the actual investment decisions for us. They help us organize uh, our information and try to do it in a, in a highly objective way. And most importantly, uh, very consistently with our, our fundamental approach. So they don't sit outside of our, our team. They, they're very much embedded with our, with our research analysts and, and portfolio managers and basically helping us try to solve the, the, the fundamental investment problems that we're trying to um, solve for and answer. Right. So there, the, when you said the fundamental investment problems, can, can we can we make a um, an example here? Can you give me an example of this interaction? I'm just fascinated by the interaction between, you know, what I perceive as like quants on the one side and fundamental analysts on the other, and it it fascinates me to to just ask about and learn about how those people can possibly interact. Well, I think all all investors, certainly uh, fundamental investors like us, are, are trying to identify misprice assets. Uh, and when we are looking for companies that are growing more than their peers and solving future problems and innovating, uh, what we're trying to assess is the magnitude of growth. How can that be different, perhaps, than what the market generally expects? And is that appreciated in the stock price? Or the more importantly, more frequently, the, it's the durability. Um, the duration of that growth have they have they built something around their their business practices that 's going to allow for them to to keep that competitive advantage for longer than what the market expects that 's really where the ineff- inefficiencies in the market exist today and that 's what we 're trying to exploit the market 's fairly efficient in the short term um, the longer term you get the more inefficient it is now that tends to lend itself to that creative um, thinking the 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 investment acumen that we 've um, accumulated collectively through the years that being said there are a number of assessments that we can make where we 're trying to uh, understand better you know what is the likelihood of a certain outcome so one thing that our 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 data analytics team helps us do is understand base rate analysis you know what is the outside view? Um, it's it's common that a, that a fundamental investor will you know will become very uh, familiar with a with a company with a management team and have a very deep insight into um, the dynamics within that company and within an industry. Sometimes an outside view of well, what is actually the likelihood 
uh, for a company to be able to extend this competitive advantage period for a period of time. How many other companies have done this? Under what circumstances have we seen companies um, be able to extend their competitive advantage for a certain period of time? And they help us with that level of, I guess, introduce some, some objectivity into our analysis. That, that would be one example of how we integrate that work. I see. Base rates, outside view. Got it. That, that, that is something all fundamental analysts could probably use because we find a business. We're so focused on looking for a business, right? A great business. And we don't ask, you know, is this maybe an industry in which one should expect to find such a business? And maybe the answer is no. And we're kind of fishing in the wrong pond. So it sounds like they help you fish in the right pond. That's a good expression. Yeah. So how much money are you managing in, you know, international growth, global leaders, international leaders? How, how much is under management in all this? We have a few more strategies within this investment platform, and it is very integrated. So that team that I described, they help manage the three strategies that, uh, that I uh, participate in. But we have oversight over five or six additional strategies, including some that are dedicated in international small cap arena, as well as dedicated emerging market strategies. And if you add all of those up um, in our platform, the assets under management would be around 40 to $45 billion. Wow. That's a lot of money. How much of that could possibly be in a small cap strategy? Um, yeah, small cap strategies, obviously more, more constrained. Um, in terms of the capacity, and we've been very disciplined through the years to to not make that to be very wary of the trade off between size and performance. So William Blair has always had a discipline of closing our small cap strategies or any strategy that might have capacity constraints uh, very early uh, in their life, if you will, or in their size. So our small cap strategies would have um, a maximum capacity of I'd say three or $4 billion. Right. That that's, that's good. So I'm guessing that with all of the froth of, you know, basically since the, the bottom of the COVID, you know, one month bear market that, uh, you're not putting any more money into small cap right now. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting if you if you look at the nature of if we if we step away from the market for a second look at the nature of the economic activity um, globally we're seeing um, what we th what we expect to be the phrase we're using is the mother of all economic recoveries you know something we have not seen in in decades um, the 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 experience that we've all been through where the economies have been more or less forced. Uh, to close by by government imposition, while while warranted, has has truly created a lot of uh, pent up uh, potential demand, and we're starting to see that in the form of of the spending, both on the consumer side, but also on the industrial activity side, and we think that that this resurgence of growth and the reopening and normalization of economic activity, plus the stimulus that's been added to the economies globally will actually provide for a, a pretty um, broad backdrop of growth. And small cap companies, uh, many of whom are, are you know, more domestically oriented that have been you know, really penalized uh, during this period, uh, we think are poised for, for relatively good growth too. So you know, we're not trying to grow our assets in the small cap space, but we are you know, always looking for new ideas within um, small cap investing. And we think now is actually a, a very good backdrop for that. So you do not, you sound bullish, man. You don't, you do not sound like a guy who's worried about exorbitant valuations or speculative froth or, or any of those things. Yeah, I think there are signs of some um, speculative activity in this sea of liquidity that we've had um, in the market. Um, those areas are generally not areas that we're going to be investing in. And I do think it, what we have felt is underappreciated from, a, from an equity investment standpoint would be the cyclical side of the economy. Um, 
in particular those where the, the spending activity has been constrained. If you think about travel and leisure as an obvious one and everything in that in that ecosystem, we think it's a it's a it's really a, a fundamental and and an inexorable trend to to travel, to have experiences, to be with friends and families, and this has been the case for several decades. Uh, we're going through a bit of a uh, difficult period where we've not been able to do that. We're already seeing signs, though, that as soon as people feel uh, safe and healthy they're going to return to that. So the cyclical side of the economy uh, around the um, services and even on the industrial side is what we think is is mispriced or undervalued. Um, I think a lot of the, the COVID beneficiary industries and companies um, I don't know if I'd call that speculative froth, but I think those areas have been have been well bid. A lot of them have had demand pulled forward in in some cases two or three years of of demand. Um, I think those are probably due for um, a bit of underperformance while they kind of grow into these larger multiples. But I but I think the more cyclical areas of the economy are poised for for good performance, both from a economic growth and corporate profit standpoint, but importantly, uh, from a market standpoint as well. So maybe uh, as you and I sit here talking, Netflix has reported and kind of disappointed everyone here just slightly, uh, well, just call it one year after the lockdowns pretty much began. That was, you know, that's one of the classic lockdown sitting at home with nothing to do, but everybody getting on Netflix kind of play. And you think there's more of that to come then maybe in other businesses that benefited from the lockdown? Uh, without commenting on the specifics of that, I think thematically that's exactly right. I think there are companies that were were, were truly beneficiaries um, of, of uh, changes in consumption, forced changes in consumption. Um, and I think there's a whole there's a whole class of those companies that probably are going to have a difficult time surprising to the to the upside, which is uh, what drives in the short term, which drives um, some stock prices. I will say that there are other industries that we do like that had demand brought forward, perhaps during the the pandemic, but we think are going to be experiencing not just a a, a pull forward, but an but an increased level of growth and adoption. And if you think everything around uh, payments, digital wallets, and the like, um, I think that has certainly been a beneficiary of this environment we've been in, but one where it's really worked well and it's been fairly seamless. Adoption rates have gone up, uh, consumer habits have changed probably for good. And I think everything around electronic and digital payments is is going to be an area while while it's benefited from this environment, probably still has a, a great deal of runway for growth and appreciation by the market. Yeah, you guys sound like you, I mean, you have a lot of money under management. You're doing a lot of things. But on one hand, you're telling us about kind of a huge viable dip in these economically sensitive areas like travel and leisure. And then on the other hand, you're telling us, no, there's a secular change here in, in payments, among other things, maybe. You're doing a lot of stuff, Ken. <laughs> you sound like a busy guy. <laughs> well, well, secular change is, is what we're focused on, um, first and foremost. And we, we really, that's where we spend our, 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 our time and our energy trying to understand that because that, those create long-lasting investable opportunities for us, either, either uh, thematically within an industry, as I mentioned, but most importantly at the company level. And when you get the intersection between special company um, with, with those intrinsic characteristics that we referenced earlier and a, and a backdrop of, of, of secular growth, that really makes for a, a, a compelling uh, investment opportunity for us. We actually um, took some time in the middle of 2020 to uh, rebase as a team and think out toward the future. If we had a 10-year view, what would be some in compelling investable themes or things that we want to pay attention to because they could lead to investment opportunities as we see shifts in the in the in the landscape be it be it be it scientific be it uh, policy be it consumer trends 
and the like. And, and we came up with, with five growth themes that we think are going to shape the future and certainly going to be on our radar screen for investment. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share those with you. Absolutely. Lay them on us. Okay. Um, rise of the machines. Think about future of factory automation. Number two, connected commerce, um, which is, you know, this, this, this merging of, of different forms of, of consumption. Uh, number three, conservation capitalism. Um, that's this notion around sustainability and, and resource management. Uh, fourth, edit genetics. That's the merging of science and, and technology. And number five, uh, we call digital reality, which is, which is the, the morphing of the physical world and, and the digital world. Um, and they all have sub themes within those, but we think each of uh, those represent a convergence between a traditional um, industry or, or set of business practices and uh, more directly applied digitalization data and technology around their businesses. So I think Rise of the Machines is the subtitle of an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, is it not? <laughs> I, I, I tried to have some fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> what? What are? Well, I, you know, I have to ask. What specifically are we talking about there? That that one intrigues me. If you think about um, the people reference the period that we've been in as or are in as industry, industry 4.0, um, and that you think about classic factory automation and robotics in the in the manufacturing environment, I think is all. You know, fairly well adopted and understand. And what we're really talking about now is if you if you add in you know increasingly complex tasks, um, technology, sensors, um, vision, et cetera, uh, 5G connectivity, artificial intelligence, all of which are not future concepts. These are all these are all being deployed to varying degrees. Really morphs the kind of industry 4.0 into the next industrial age, if you will. So we're, we're calling that productivity 5.0. And that is really replacing, you know, much more complex tasks that have maybe been um, human endeavors um, into things that uh, robotics, um, CNC machines and, and the like um, can do. And, and we really think that this is um, going to you know continue apace. This has been a, a trend for for decades. We just don't think that that's slowing down. So Ken, I know I know you work for a big company here. Will your chief compliance officer let you give me a name in each of these categories? <laughs> um, we could probably we can probably do that. Um, if you if you think about um, um, factory automation, one one thing I mentioned was the the importance of of sensors, um, and we're seeing that whether it's in consumer appliances and electronics that we have at home that that talk to us, or or we talk to them to instruct them to do things, whether it's the the car, which you know, computer on wheels essentially, um, now or you know, industrial B two B applications, the the importance of sensors um, is really driving that. So you think about the the raw material for that. Um, semiconductors uh, enabling this this type of activity and one of our one of our favorite companies that's been a holding in our portfolios for you know 10 plus years is Kients of Japan and it's one of the world leading uh, manufacturers and distributors of these uh, leading edge sensor technologies across all applications and and we're really on a you know what we would consider an s curve of adoption there. So that's one where this company is truly a special company, tremendous, tremendous culture, um, shows as, as one of the leading employers in, in all of the surveys um, in, in Japan and now increasingly uh, globally, including here in the US. And we really think this company is uh, truly special. Sounds great. Um, I'm assuming, you know, connected commerce was the next one that I, that I wrote down. So, uh, you know, that's obviously gotten a huge secular kind of kick in the pants from the whole COVID situation. What, what What's the trend there? What, you know, tell me about the trend and, and how you think of it and, and give us a name for that one. Well, I think, I think the, again, the enablers here, why, why do we expect this to not just continue to be what we've experienced thus far, but to you know, pick up its pace of adoption and growth 
are things enabling technologies like um, artificial intelligence and increased computing power. Uh, we've talked about robotics and, and automation, uh, connectivity. In this case, you know, even even blockchain uh, for uh, for transaction support. So you, you put all of those together, and the themes that we get out of that are are where products discover you as a consumer versus the other way around. Uh, you think about transactions being increasingly friction free and and, and cashless or, or more immediate settlement. Um, you could see in 10 years that um, some sort of digital currency will, will take some share of those, uh, of those uh, transactions. And supply chains that you know, increasingly are, are integrated and, and you know, closer to real time. So more personalized products delivered more or less instantly. Uh, to people, and and again, we've we've seen this across the board thus far, and you, and you get companies that are leading edge in this, conventional companies that are leading edge in this, like a um, like a Nike in, in in the U.S. Obviously, that has seen a massive shift in their direct to consumer business that they had been investing in well well ahead of the pandemic in a in a step change function in a positive way, um, or um, a company like Mercado Libre uh, of South America, Mercado Libre um, is, you know, very much a, a dominant e-commerce provider uh, in that um, continent, much like we see the combination of of Amazon and and eBay in the U.S. And so, you know, these are these would be good examples of we think leading edge practitioners there. Oh, this is good stuff, Ken. Next is uh, conservation capitalism. What do you see there? Well, you know, everything around sustainability is 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 very much uh, in vogue. I think that there's become a generational shift there in in the importance of understanding um, long term sustainability, uh, what that means for our environment, what that means for for future generations and what we've really seen now uh, we believe is a is a tipping of the balance where both the supply uh, and demand side of that equation are now much more aligned so we're we're undergoing at the very least a bit of an energy uh, transition uh, which would be a part of this uh, you think about the number of company uh, countries excuse me that have targeted carbon neutrality uh, by by 2050, this net zero policies and the thing. So we think the energy transition is underway, and whether it's by uh, virtue of government policy or uh, which is supportive, I think of of public policy, or by the availability of of technologies um, to be enablers of this transition. That's the that's the supply side of the equation now catching up with. Uh, with that demand, so we mentioned sensors uh, as as one of the uh, ways to um, uh, integrate more connectivity between uh, machines. That that's certainly uh, going to be a beneficiary. If you also think about um, uh, enabling technology, so so companies that that help do things more uh, efficiently um, would be an example of that. Um, so companies that make electric uh, motors um, efficient, more much more efficient energy consumption on the industrial side. Helma of the of the UK is a company that we invest in there. That's that's quite interesting. Or companies that are leading the the way in terms of uh, enabling technologies around um, you know, different forms of more efficient fuels, be it be it biofuels. Um, and the like. So a, a company um, from uh, Scandinavia, Orsted, is one that we that we like uh, in that realm as well. So there's a lot of companies beyond kind of the obvious, um, you know, solar or wind energy companies that are really helping enable this transition. Oh, nice. Okay. And Edit Genetics, I have to say, Edit Genetics, there's, a, there's another sort of creepy sci-fi connotation there as soon as i hear that you know i think of of uh you know creating some genetically weird human who's stronger and smarter and faster and going to kill the rest of us or something but but what does it mean to you 
if, if you think about um, if you think about the merging of 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 science and technology now in a way that we're going to get step change in 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 some um, medical and healthcare practices um, that that's what this means to us. So on one hand, you've got um, humans that have increasingly the ability to monitor their own health uh, with the help of, of, of technology and the ability to do things in the lab um, that we, that we couldn't do before, you know, started with a genome, sequencing, um, CRISPR, uh, liquid biopsies on the horizon, all of those things together, we think we're going to be moving into a, uh, a, a new era of healthcare and one that ultimately we'd like to believe uh, leads to more prevention um, rather than just treating the, the acute nature of any illness or disease. That's the holy grail of, of, of medicines. And obviously governments are very much aligned around this outcome. And if we can do more early or more early detection, change more consumer habits, get treatments earlier so that we, we can prevent risks. Um, those are areas that are very interesting to us. So by extension, um, we've seen a, a great development around companies that not just do the science and the research themselves, but are the enablers of all of that. And they've, to many degrees, have built very complex uh, systems to do the outsourced research for the companies or to do the outsourced manufacturing, increasingly complex to manufacture, if you think about biologics in particular, and that's become uh, a group of specialized industries. So to us, um, it's really difficult to assess the outcome of a particular drug that's in, in development. Um, I don't know many people that can do that with, 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 with consistency and regularity. So what we're very focused on is, you know, what companies are enabling those companies to be successful. Think about the, um, you know, selling the picks and the shovels rather than the, the, the gold miners themselves. And so we have a lot of investments in companies that help us, help us do, uh, help those companies do just that. So think about uh, Charles River Laboratories in the U.S. Um, and an outsource research company or uh, Lanza group of Switzerland, who's an outsourced manufacturing company, really leading the way uh, from a technological capability to, to do things that virtually no other uh, healthcare company can, can provide. I have to say, Ken, we're getting more names out of you than like any previous four guests or something. You're doing great. <laughs> we appreciate it. So one more category, digital reality. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> um, yeah, people have referred to this as the uh, you know as the metaverse or something else. I, it seems like you're a science fiction fan, so maybe you'll you'll know that phrase. But it's really the merging of the of the virtual and the physical worlds. And if if, and if you think about that, you know what we're consuming increasingly is beyond just uh, buying uh, buying goods and services, but having digital. Um, experiences, if you will, or having a digital representation or, or, or a copy uh, of something. And, you know, that is where we think um, we're going to see a great deal of growth. If you think about, say, the music industry or media, that's, that's pretty well established, the digital delivery and consumption of that. You think about education, maybe that's slightly penetrated, but that's probably got a lot of growth in terms of, you know, virtual or uh, 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 technologically enabled education. And then we like to think about even, even luxury or lifestyle um, as a service, if you will, that really has not been uh, understood or, or exploited um, yet. You know, the, this big boom in, in, in uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, in the last few months has been, has been pretty interesting. It, while that might be speculative, I have no idea. I think the concept between, say, digital collectible goods as a uh, as a show of of style or value, just the same way that someone consumes a a, a physical good, be it a piece of art or a luxury handbag, will our digital representations of us um, 
in the future be be kind of proxies for that physical representation of of status and taste and things like that. So this is really an interesting space. It's I don't know how investable it is uh, right now, but we think this is a this is going to be increasingly something that we'll all be experiencing and consuming in a in a dozen years. Right, the NFT craze. A lot things get started that way a lot in the world. You know, something sort of crazy and frivolous happens, but it turns out as a proof of concept of something much more substantial, and and it looks. I, I agree. It, it makes all the sense yeah, in the world that you represent art and collectibles and things with with NFTs. I agree. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. And you're right. It is. It is on the on the on the uh, early stage adopters. But I think this will become mainstream and probably happen sooner than we think. Can I get you to, uh, while, while we're on um, a topic like that, we, you did mention when we were talking about payments, digital payments and things, it, it sounded like you were almost going to express a, an opinion about cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I, I was not because I, we don't have a, uh, we don't have any investments um, directly in, in that, I do think everything around um, electronic payments is going to ultimately give way to some form of digital currencies. In, in, in the, you know, there are there are benefits to that, and the you know the blockchain benefits of of the uh, ability to to track the history of something and to provide that level of very secure authentic <clears throat> authentication. I think there's a great deal of value. In that, I, I don't know about um, adoption of any of any cryptocurrency, um, at least not in the near term widespread. But I do think there are applications um, that we will see. And again, I think in in ten years' time, this will be very, very much more well developed than it is today. So we let's just say that we have. We have a lot of eyeballs on this space, but not really investing in anything right now. Okay, fair enough. Well, we've, we've been talking for quite a while, Ken, and it's been absolutely wonderful. I mean, you've really taken us to a lot of different places. You gave us more than your share of names, which we appreciate. And I hope that you will come back and talk with us um, again sometime. But I do have my final question. Same final question for every guest. If you could leave us with a single thought today, if you could leave our listener with a single thought today, what would it be? The single thought is change is, is constant and evolution is 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 a is a constant. And so as investors, um, to be very much focused on uh, how things are likely to evolve in the future, what 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 challenges we can make to our own current assumptions or the status quo, uh, I think is essential. I think, I think growth is an imperative. Um, and I think as investors, I think having an eye toward the future where we can see opportunities and frankly, where we could see the disruption and the risks that introduced to us, uh, that's where we're, that's where we're laser focused. And I think having, having curiosity combined with discipline is, is the best, is the best approach any investor can take. Nicely done. Thank you for that. All right, Ken. Listen, thanks for being here. I got a lot out of this. I'm taking notes. I'm I'm going to be looking up these names. I, I just thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate the time. Wow. I I hope that you were taking good notes uh, during that, and that you wrote down all those names. You know, and if you didn't get them all, go back and listen and and write them down and look them up. I, I like I said, Ken gave us he gave us more names than any you know three or four guests usually give us. So that alone was really awesome. And also those five areas that he named that they're looking at, that is really cool. I got a lot out of this. I really got a, a lot out of this. I hope you did too. Man, Ken, Ken's a great guy. I like, I like hearing from him. And we'll hear from him again probably in the next six or 12 months. We'll invite him back. Uh, but for now, I just want to look at the mailbag. Let's do that right now. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. Or you can give us a call at our listener feedback line 
800-381-2357. That's 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind. We love hearing from you. We love feedback. I can't stress it enough. Feedback makes the world go round. It really does. If you're operating in a vacuum in this world and you're not getting plenty of feedback, you can't grow. So I want to grow. You want to grow. We want to grow. Feedback. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. Listener feedback line 800-381-2357. It's really important. Okay. Our first bit of feedback comes from Anthony H. this week. And he says, the Fed seems to never say anything hawkish, only accommodating to free money. It seems like they have nowhere to go since they're the only ones supplying leverage and buying treasuries bonds. So does this just continue until another collapse? Just the other day, Powell, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, just the other day, Powell said, this is not the time to worry about the deficit, despite the strong recovery and forecasted growth they keep talking about. Do you think we would ever have a sovereign debt crisis similar to what people like Jim Rickards and Peter Schiff talk about? Interested in your opinion? Thanks again, Anthony H. I wouldn't take a sovereign debt crisis off the table, but for me, the crisis would have to be the value of the U.S. dollar, right? It's very, the, the U.S. dollar is something like 80% of the world's transactions, 60 odd percent or 59 or 60 percent of of foreign exchange reserves around the world, you know, it's hard to sell anything without buying U.S. dollars. So it would be natural to think that the world's reserve currency just can't be dented because the demand for it is is forever and massive. But I think it's, I still, I'm an old school guy. I still think you can, you can print too many of them. And and you can cause real inflation in doing it. And I'll tell you, I saw a number the other day, um, I forget who published it, of like 12 trillion worth of liquidity as a result of all the extraordinary measures during COVID by the you know governments and, and central bank. I was like, wow, 12 trillion sounds like an awful lot. If that doesn't start to cause inflation, maybe the maybe the MMTers are right, you know, the, the modern monetary theorists. <laughs> But it's a good question. I thank you for asking it, Anthony. Next comes Al M. Al is one of our very frequent correspondents. And I I don't always get to answer uh, Al M's question. But Al, thanks thanks for writing in once again. Very thoughtful guy. He's got a lot to say here. I can't read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick out what I think are the good parts. I think you'll get the gist. He says, I didn't really understand your reasoning on this idea of gold as a bauble. I said that, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago here and in the uh, the Stansberry Digest that I do each week. He continues, he says, I collect Anasazi Indian pottery and I really enjoy my collection. The pots just seem beautiful to me. That seems very human, that appreciation of perfection done by hand or the human eye. In the case of pottery, I have no expectation that it will hold the value of my work and saving discipline. I so far do not really see the connection you described to gold. It seems to me that my objective in holding gold would be to preserve my savings rather than as an enjoyable bauble. Money is needed in this damn society, Al says, and everyone is trying to take everyone else's money away from them, especially the government. It seems gold is a way to hold value at times. If one is patient enough to wait till it comes around to its original value. That would be my hope in holding gold. Now that I have tried to describe my feelings on this, I suspect it is different for everyone. After having discussed this with my wife, I can see that it's a different for everyone because she would like more Tiffany jewelry. <laughs> LM. Thank you, Al. Yeah, so gold is a bauble. What, what I intended there, maybe I didn't spell it out right, but it just seems to me that you know, five or 6,000 years ago or sometime before that, whenever we, whenever mankind sort of discovered gold and first got fascinated with it, I'm kind of guessing that it was, you know, just the sort of fascination of a child and, and the um, appreciation for something of beauty rather than immediately saying, oh, this is gold. We can use this to store value and it'll be good for the next 6,000 years, you know, and, and it really, I don't know if there's a lot more to it than that. To me, it just seems that 
And I was also remember talking about Warren Buffett's view on this. You know, we dig it out of the ground and then we, you know, turn it into a bar and then we put it in the ground, basically in a vault, you know. And, and after 100 years, it's just the same as it ever was. And of course, that's the point. He thinks that's a criticism of gold. And I think that is, that is a, a feature, not a bug. That's, that's what you want it to do. You want it to be the same. You throw it in the ocean. It's impervious to, you know, to seawater. It's, it's inert. It's an inert substance. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change. And that's the idea. That's what makes it a great store of value. And it's shiny and it's heavy and it's malleable. And that's what makes it a bauble. So Hopefully, Al, there's, there's more explanation there for you. <laughs> That's about all I can do. Next is Ludwig H., another frequent correspondent. Ludwig, I appreciate all your emails. Keep them coming. I know I don't always get to respond to you. I'm trying to give everybody a chance. But this week, Ludwig says, who's the best author of investment books and why? I'm more interested in the motivation than the name. Okay, Ludwig, I think I know what you're going for here. And I'm going to give you a very one very specific answer, and that is Joel Greenblatt, the former hedge fund manager, investor, author. The way he writes, it's just, it's the perfect combination of a conversation with a very intelligent person, but it's not overly technical at all. It's just this perfect sort of conversational explanation of of some pretty, in, in some cases, some pretty sophisticated material. Any book by Joel Greenblatt, any one. Uh, I think they're all excellent. I think the writing is excellent. The thinking is excellent. And they're, they're must-reads. Joel Greenblatt. Good question. Next comes Coach Z. Coach Z says, great podcast. I never miss it. Dan is fantastic. Thank you, Coach. I appreciate that. He brings on knowledgeable guests, guides them with poignant questions, and lets them answer. Dan always talks of leverage. My question is, does leverage ever make sense in a trading or investing scenario? If so, under what circumstances, Coach Z? Good question, Coach. Excellent question, in fact. And sure, it just it's not whether or not you use leverage. It's how you do it. For example, I am currently holding some out of the money put options on various large equity indexes, because that's just something I think you should do uh, when the market gets really frothy and, and other things, you know, happen in the market. And that's an, in, that's an inherently levered instrument. I can take a very small position. And if the market really goes nuts and drops really fast, the, the inherent leverage will turn a very small stake into possibly an enormous return. So you can, you know, you can take a little half percent of your portfolio or something or less. And, you know, it could, it could bring you double digit returns on the overall portfolio if, if it performs, uh, as I suggest. And you, you know, other forms of leverage like Warren Buffett, you know, I, I've seen it estimated that he's got, you know, 1.6 to one, like 60% leverage there by using float and, and, you know, he uses insurance float to make investments. Uh, and that of course has gone on for, you know, half a century with him. It's gone on for a very, very long time. And it's a really cool use of leverage because he's, he's, he's not going to have it called away really. You know, he's not going to have like a broker, you know, just sell him out because the position is deteriorating. You know, there's not, there's never going to be a margin call. And, you know, the, the balance sheet is such a tank. It's such a fortress that it's, you know, he's just never going to get in big trouble. He's never gotten in real big trouble with it. It's brilliant. So yeah, it makes sense, but you got to know how to do it so that you don't blow yourself up. I think is the simple answer. Good question. Finally, this week, Elsa G says, when you want to have gold, it's usually also good to have some gold miners. They are leveraged compared to gold price. So do you think it is the same with Bitcoin stocks? For example, Hive, there is a miner. And Galaxy, there is a kind of crypto financial bank, Elsa G. Sure, that's, this is not a, a bad way to think about things. What I believe I have to offer for you, Elsa, is just remember 
that a, for example, let's take the simpler example you, you put of a gold mining stock. You say it's leveraged compared to the gold price. You know, that may be true, but gold mining is a business, right? It's not just a machine for levering up the gold price, right? So things can affect the performance of that stock that really don't have anything to do with the gold price. You know, you could wake up one morning and the mines flooded or the workforce walked out the door or, you know, all kinds of stuff. So just be careful in thinking that, well, I own gold, but I also own leverage to gold in, in, in gold stocks. It, it's not an unsound thing, but just make sure you truly appreciate what it is that you own if you own you know, whether it's gold mining companies or, you know, the crypto financial bank that you describe here or, you know, a, a crypto miner, whatever it is, make sure you understand that it's not just leverage to the price of the commodity. It's also a business that has its own unique characteristics. But good question. Thank you for asking. That's another mailbag and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode, but sometimes it does take a little while for it to show up on the website. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want and scroll all the way down and then click on the word transcript. If you like this episode, send somebody else a link to the podcast so we can continue to grow. Anybody you know who might enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at Investor underscore Hour. You have a guest you want me to interview, drop me a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or give me a call at the new listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell me what's on your mind. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.